We had a lot of land. And then the miners came through and the railroads came through. So. And then they put us way over here in this little corner in southeastern Colorado where there was nothing. There was nothing. 
this is the place where they were supposed to get rid of us completely. This was, that was their objective. This is the place that we were supposed to be taken off this earth. They tried. Back on November 29th, 1864, at 9 a.m. in the morning, Colonel Chivington attacked a peaceful camp of Cheyenne Rapho people. Black Kettle rose the flag and the white flag of truce for protection. But the soldiers, they disregarded the, the flag and attacked the people, mutilating the dead, cutting parts off the, the, for war trophies. Can you just imagine everything that went on that, that morning? And some of the women thought, you know, the buffalo were coming, you know, that, but instead it was the troops. The horses, hooves. My grandfather was just a, My grandfather was just a toddler. And um, I read somewhere that the battle lasted like nine hours. But uh, my grandfather was just a toddler and he was uh, breastfed. And he had um, his older sister was like four years old, and their parents hit them under a, a river bank, or maybe it was a creek bed, somewhere uh, along Sand Creek and where the battle was taking place. But the, um, my grandfather's parents were killed earlier in the battle. Well, um, I don't like to call it a battle. I call it a massacre. And so they hit under there till the, um, the massacre subsided a little. And then my grandfather got hungry. So his older four-year-old sister would take him to their dead mother and he would um, he would nurse, nurse on his dead mother. And it decimated one whole nation of people, language, culture, history. Massacred. We got strong blood. We're still here. Growing up in Denver, I didn't learn about the Sand Creek Massacre in school. We were taught about the pioneers, the gold rush, about those coming west manifesting their destiny. We didn't learn about the people on whose land we lived. In fact, I don't know that I'd ever met a Cheyenne or Arapaho person until making this film. I asked Dr. Little Bear what he thinks about a white person making a film about Sand Creek. You know, one of the things that uh, contributes to a lot of the stereotypes about Native Americans is that we are set in a comfortable past for many white people when actually we're still here. After Sand Creek, the Cheyenne and Arapaho were forced out of Colorado to reservations in Oklahoma, Wyoming, and Montana. Before starting this film, I go to Oklahoma to meet the Southern Cheyenne Massacre Descendants representative, Joe Big Medicine. Joe instructs me it's customary to make offerings of tobacco and money when approaching tribal representatives with questions. 
He invites me to the next tribal consultation at the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. On the way there, driving down Highway 96, I pass through a town named for Shivington. In the same Denver cemetery where Shivington's buried lie the Hungates, a settler family murdered on the plains in June 1864. The newspapers blamed Indians, though there was no proof. The family's bodies were publicly displayed in Denver by authorities, inciting fear of Native people and spurring conflicts throughout the territory. In August, Governor John Evans issued a proclamation calling for volunteers to enlist in the cavalry to fight hostile Indians. Later that year, the volunteers of the 3rd Regiment committed the Sand Creek Massacre, and the Hungates became martyrs for Manifest Destiny. In summer 1864, as violence erupted on the plains following the Hungate murders, Cheyenne Chief Black Kettle wrote to Governor Evans, offering to make peace. That September, at the Camp Weld Conference, Evans told Black Kettle as long as his tribe stayed on their reservation along Sandy Creek, they'd be safe from further attack. So Black Kettle took his people there. Two officers, Captain Silas So and Lieutenant Joseph Kramer, didn't fire on the people. They halted their men to put their arms down. And a lot of the people got away that came from here. I'm an example. If they didn't got away, I wouldn't be here today. Chief Black Kettle survived the massacre. His wife, Medicine Woman, was shot nine times, but she survived too. A few weeks after the attack, Captain Silas Soule sent a letter to his superiors describing the massacre in graphic detail. He wrote, You would think it impossible for white men to butcher and mutilate human beings as they did there. Who was responsible for this attack? The, the person most responsible was John Evans. Well, John Evans was appointed by President Abraham Lincoln to become the Colorado Territorial Governor in 1862. His major mission was to build railroads in Colorado. It just so happens that in 1862, Colorado is in line to be part of the transcontinental route to the West. But first, they have to extinguish the title to Indian lands. And the Indians were looked at as obstacles to progress to a country that was about manifesting its destiny. And we were nothing but savages who stood in the way of that progress. Once you look at a crime scene, one of the things you look at is What happened after the crime? Within 11 months of Sand Creek, the Cheyennes and Arapahoes no longer have title to any of this land in Colorado. What John Evans really wanted was to remove the Cheyenne and Arapaho from the eastern plains of Colorado, to get clear title to the land so that he could build his railroad. He, more than any other person, caused the creation of the 3rd Regiment. Think of the 3rd Regiment as a loaded gun. He handed that loaded gun to Shivington, and Shivington pulled the trigger. We were deemed savages and heathens. And yet, the people who who did the more savvy things, they were glorified. By the 20th century, John Evans's role at Sand Creek was pretty much forgotten. 
people of Colorado regarded him as their foremost builder. And to show their appreciation, they named the highest peak in the front range after him, Mount Evans. To understand American history, you have to understand it from a different way, a different perspective. And part of that is owning up to all of this. Well, John Evans was not an aberration. He is representative of a white America. Sand Creek was only one massacre that was ever documented. No one doesn't talk about the three or 400 years before that when they were killing them hundreds of thousands at a time. The genocide started with the doctrine of discovery after Columbus supposedly discovered this country. People that were about the business of settling this continent from the Atlantic to the Pacific thought that that's, it was their divine right to take the land and to own it. Four years after Sand Creek, on another cold November morning, General George Armstrong Custer led an attack on a sleeping band of Cheyenne, camped along the banks of the Washita River in present-day Oklahoma. That morning, Black Kettle and his wife, Medicine Woman, were killed. I had a great-grandmother, white buffalo woman, she was a midwife and a doctor of horses. From Sand Creek until the day she died in 1938, she never went to bed without her moccasin son. It was for fear of having to flee another Sand Creek or another Washita. Dr. Mann and I visit the American Indian Cultural Center and Museum in Oklahoma City. It sits empty and incomplete on land that was once a Shell oil refinery. And the state of Oklahoma decided that they were going to create this place dedicated to the 39 tribes located in the state. However, it did not quite work out that way. Construction ultimately had to stop. The money just wasn't there. I asked Henrietta why it couldn't get funded. It's an Indian project. Pure and simple. At the same time the center ran out of money, the 10th tallest skyscraper west of the Mississippi was built for $750 million. It belongs to an oil company. There's still that whole aspect of manifest destiny that you can still see in different forms. The tribes had worked for decades before finally getting Sand Creek named a National Historic Site in 2007. During tribal consultations, the representatives stay in Lamar, about 35 miles south of the site. I asked Karen Little Coyote if she feels welcomed in Lamar. Uh, I just know they're not too friendly around here. <laughs> you know, the other night we pulled up to Hickory House and there was uh, three ladies up there by the cash register and then they kept looking out and seeing us standing there and that one went over there and locked the door. We would have still had time to go in. I hope and that they'll come to understand that that's a very derogatory name. And what if we had an Indian school? What if we called them the pale faces, you know, or whiteies? I still uh, remember hearing some of my teachers when I was in grade school. Indians can't learn. 
even up to high school when I wanted to go to college. The counselor asked me, well, what are you going to do uh, after high school? I said, well, I'm going to go to college. He chuckled. Uh, said, don't you know Indians don't go to college? <laughs> I told him, I said, well, this Indian's going to go to college. Be careful, I've been told ever since I was a little boy. They're, they're tricksters. We remain very cautious. Even like all night when you came to interview me, I was suspicious and I told you all right. Why are you doing this? I'm still that way. I've been taught that way by my parents and them by their parents. Just like what happened down there. Put that American flag up, that white flag. American troops won't hurt you. It's been violated over and over and over again. When some of the survivors from Sand Creek moved north, our northern people saw them. They wept for them. The spirit of revenge was so powerful. They raided constantly down on the trails and roads that went into Denver City, killing white people whenever they could. And uh, well, I could almost feel that, almost feel that in my body, in my thinking. Fort Robinson, the Washita, Sand Creek. We still end up talking about them every day as if they were, as if they are still a part of us, and they still are. Because we look at life and time in the circular fashion, not linearly. With a linear history, not only does it recede backwards, it becomes different geographically. Maybe it becomes cloud land. Maybe trees are cut down. Somehow it's altered. Hisil Wutshit is the Cheyenne name for Sand Creek. Hisil Wutshit means a lot of things. It encompasses all the spirituality of that area. Of the people who died there, all these memories. My great grandmother, my grandfather, my father, me. Four generations removed. I can still feel it. Historical trauma is defined as a collective and cumulative wounding across generations that is a result of massive cataclysmic events planned by government and targeting a specific group of people to control or eradicate them. Sand Creek really hurt our people. Now that I'm older, I can see the results of, of the trauma, the healing that still has to take place. These traumas are historically anchored, but they're deeply connected to ongoing policies and ongoing daily conditions that affect people's lives. Up to today, we're still fighting with the government. We're still fighting for our land because they're taking bits and pieces here and there. They can't ever make it right. Historically traumatic events for indigenous peoples really begin at the colonization of this land and 
are connected to forced relocation, forced Christianity, and forced Western ways of being. If you have these massive interruptions to your ability to identify yourself as a cultural person, as an individual within a community, there is this loss, this deep loss. We have a lot of poverty, unemployment on the res. Our children are going this other way. They're not taught the traditional way of life. Yet, we still have our ceremonies, our culture, and our language. The fact that we are still here is an act of absolute strength and power. And indigenous people are incredibly resilient. What kind of monument shall we build to a history that continues to haunt the descendants of its victims and perpetrators? Our suppressed histories will haunt us until we unbury them. History is a living thing. It must be tended to and kept on the surface of our collective consciousness. The Sand Creek Massacre Spiritual Healing Run, it's a healing ceremony that you know, our tribes put on to bring awareness to the event. The days we run, we think about our ancestors. We're cleansing that trail that their body parts are taking on. It's really hard to think about, to um, comprehend the pain that they felt, especially the women and the children. Whenever the cold air, when they hit us, it just reminded me like, dang, you know, they suffered more. It's hard to pray in a positive way and think about this event. Our bodies are tired from running, but yet we still want to continue. You know, let's get to Denver and show Denver that we're still here. Being here today doesn't feel like I'm either in Montana, here in Colorado, Oklahoma. It just feels like home because our Cheyennes are here. <laughs> <laughs>